There we are then. It's, uh, <laughs> it really came about, it's the title of this talk, is I, I, I gave it to a conference in Dublin, uh, and the, the questions asked there are saying, this looks more like Irish stuff than Welsh <laughs> stuff you've got here. Uh, so, hence the title here. And, and just before I start, a, a big thanks to all the volunteers. It was a community excavation, and we had, I've added up over the years, I think we had over 100 different people volunteering on this excavation, so many thanks to all those, some of which are in the audience today. It wouldn't have happened without them. And also the funders, uh, mostly CADU, but also, again, the European Union as part of their Ancient Connections project, one of the last ones that will happen, and also the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park, at the Nineveh, the Nineveh Charitable Trust, and also it's, we're doing it as a, a joint project with the University of Sheffield, uh, Katie Hamer, who specialises in the human remains analysis, uh, is doing all that side of work. She's actually now moved to uh, UCL, University College London, but taken all the, all the bones with her to there. But anyway, it's a, it's a strange site. It's, it's, it's always been known about, but there's no <coughs> history attached to it whatsoever. So the only thing, the only reference to it, historical reference, is this, which is this written about the year 1600, uh, which then St. Patrick's Chapel is described as being ruinous or decayed, is a term used. And this is it, this is, this is the history of the site. That's all we know. Ratio, is that still okay at the back? Mm. Okay. Ratio, that, that's a lot. So the obvious answer to the first question I asked there, is it Irish or Welsh? Well, it's called St. Patrick's Chapel, so that's a pretty obvious connection there straight away. Yeah, but it's a bit faint now, it's getting a bit of a... Is that better again? Yeah. Okay. It's a... But quite clear that this name is, is only referenced in for about 1600. We don't know how far back it goes. And just so you know where we are, I mean, I, I suspect many people in this room actually visit the site when doing excavations, or at least have been to White Sands Bay where it's located. So it's right on the, the west coast of, of Wales, at the busiest tourist beach in Wales, at White Sands Bay. Uh, and often it's, it's lots of visitors go there and say, it's always quite remote, isn't it? You're out of the way here. What's it doing? Well, I think you need to look at it in, in a different way altogether and look at it like this. And there it is, St. Patrick's Chapel. And the period we're talking about, the, well, up to day recently, actually, uh, the, the way you got around, you communicated with people, was actually across the sea. You used the sea and boats rather than across the land. And certainly going from... St. Patrick's to Southern Ireland, you can do it in about 12 hours or so, uh, and they still do it in rowing races, they still do that uh, today. Uh, whereas if you get from, say, from here to St. Patrick's across the la by walking, it's going to take about three days. So actually, sh it's not remote, it's not isolated, actually it's on the major communication routes of Western Britain. So that's the first thing to remember, it's, it's not isolated, it's not remote. And just so you know where it is, I'm sure most of you have been here. There it is. It's surrounded by uh, orange uh, barrier tape there just before we start the excavation. And you see a nice, nice sandy beach uh, there of, of White Sands Bay. But if you've been here a few years ago, in fact, in uh, 2014, uh, this is what you would have seen. The huge storms that, that early in that year stripped all the sand off, off the beach. In one night, all the sand just disappeared completely. Uh, and it slowly came back, much to relief for the, the tourist authorities. Because <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's sort of a, you know, come and visit stony beach isn't quite the same thing as, as white sands. But it slowly returned, and by about June, it was just about back as it was. Uh, but the site itself, which is here, which is essentially a sand dune, was quite badly damaged in those storms. Uh, the National Park who actually owned the site, Pembrokeshire Coast National Park, uh, are protected by massive boulders. Uh, uh, and about 10 years prior to 2014, and they were just completely stripped out one night by the storms. In fact, some of the boulders ended up in the car park. Uh, they went back and put them back straight away. And the next night, they just disappeared again in the next big storm. At that point, they said, well, you just can't protect this site physically. You've got to do something else with it. And really, the only way to, to 
to do it, to protect it, is, was to excavate and get as much information out as we possibly could. And those storms did reveal quite a lot. Uh, it's been known for about 100 years that there's been human remains slowly eroding out of the, uh, out of the site. Uh, but that big storm uh, revealed, uh, I think it's about four or five previously unknown graves. Uh, and this is a skull uh, in a, what we call a kiss grave, which I'll sh show some slides at later on, uh, what a kiss grave is. Uh, we removed those, those skulls for safekeeping in, in January 2014. Uh, but one was actually found rolling down the beach by somebody. Uh, it was that sort of severe storm which we managed to recover that one as well. And we were able to reunite them with a proper, with the rest of the skeletons when we did the excavation. And that just shows just how close we are to the beach. This is 2014. Uh, there we are. It's, it's, it's pretty obvious that we are smack on the, on the beach itself. Uh, and the chapel itself sits in, the site itself is sort of round there. Uh, we don't know how much we've lost to see, uh, but we know it's at least uh, from the uh, later medieval period when a chapel wall was built around the site, about two or three metres of that is, is gone, but we suspect actually there's, uh, there's quite a bit more further out than that is also gone, but several metres at least, if not more, but we're not sure exactly how much. So what I'm going to concentrate on really just this talk, it's, it's, this is a talk, you sort of, there's, there's so many different aspects to it. It could be sort of several talks in one, and usually it's about a sort of 50 minute talk or so. So I'm really going to look at the, uh, what you might, some people, myself included, might call the most interesting aspects of it. Uh, other people are perhaps more interested in the uh, analysis of human remains, I actually say the later bit is more interesting, the cemetery itself. But I'm going to look at the, the first bit, which is from the 8th century onwards. Essentially what it is to say, it's a sand dune site, and sometime in the past, probably in the prehistoric period, sand began to, windblown sand began to, to form. Uh, and it got to about so thick, about a metre and a half deep of sand, and it stabilised, and a nice soil formed over it. And there's no evidence of any, any human activity whatsoever in that sand at all. So the soil formed, uh, and then round about 750, uh, people came along and started doing things. And what they do, did was build an oval-shaped enclosure, of which you had most of, you see there. Uh, never any higher than that, uh, with an entrance just there, facing the beach, facing due west onto the beach, uh, and a central rectangular structure. And inside it, which is not shown here on this photograph, uh, was a, a pavement laid down of quartz pebbles. Uh, there's no cemetery, there's no graveyard at this stage, uh, but these, these holes, these grave-shaped holes are graves, but they're later, they're later ones which are dug through uh, this. Uh, and interestingly, we had this black deposit soil here and also just outside the entrance itself is interesting, you can't see it so well in that photograph, but that upright stone is almost like, almost like a style, uh, and the top of it was quite highly polished, where people were climbing over it in the past uh, from where, so I quote people did, did access this site. That's just the plan of it. So we've got almost all the enclosure, but you see it there, the entrance, rectangular structure, and this sort of these coloured bits of this very dark soil, which is really interesting stuff when we actually start to excavate it. Uh, I'll just show a slide of it. You can see the very black soil there. The photographs are sometimes difficult to understand on this, this, this site because we dug it in sections. So 2014 we did the first bit, which was a narrow strip along the eroding edge, about two metres wide. And we turned in 2015 and 2016 for three weeks each and did another strip inside of that, which is this bit here. So 2014 we excavated there, 2015-16 here, and then 2019 <coughs> and 21 here. 
So the photographs are quite difficult to understand. But this is this black soil deposit, which was outside the open enclosure. And when we excavated it very carefully, sieved it all, took lots of different samples to analyse later on. And it contained lots of artefacts. Uh, and normally in early, this, this what we call the early medieval period, uh, you're lucky to come away with sort of two or three artefacts, basically, if you're, if you're really lucky. And often you come away with nothing on these sort of sites. So here we had a lot. We've seen glass beads, some more glass beads, blue glass beads. These are not Roman uh, and they're not Iron Age, although they look very similar. These are early medieval glass beads. <laughs> uh, these blue glass beads with bits of white swirly stuff on them, uh, sort of, that, that, that's a technique that's for probably about 2,000 years. <coughs> but the actual design of these is very uh, typical of the early medieval period. And Mark Redknapp of the National Museum, who's, who's looked at all the artefacts, uh, says the only parallels to these are from Ireland. Uh, and very few of them, you're only talking about a handful known altogether across the whole of the UK and Ireland. Uh, so they are they've got quite clear connections there. The other things that looking at here don't look very exciting. These are bits of crucible <coughs> for melting bronze. So doing bronze work on a site. They're about the size of an egg cup, tiny little things, lots of bits of those. And they're pouring obviously the molten bronze into moulds, which are these little clay moulds, making little bronze artefacts. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, well, they're quite fragmentary, those moulds, uh, and Mark can't identify what's being made exactly. There's no known parallels to what they're making, but they seem to be little, some sort of little discs and bits of fittings, and Mark suggests actually they're making little bronze fittings to put onto a wooden cross. Uh, lots of those, lots of bits of those. The other thing we've got is lots of bits of, tiny bits of amber flakes, they're obviously making amber beads, amber artefacts, bringing the amber to the site, manufacturing stuff there. A little bit of iron working taking place as well. Lots and lots of burnt animal bone, uh, where they're consuming uh, mostly sheep, mostly cattle, but also uh, seabirds, uh, and type of things you wouldn't eat normally, and also very small birds, and also fish, both deep sea fish and inland fish, sorry, in, in shore fish. Uh, so whole, basically it's a feasting site where they're doing, making craft manufacture uh, and feasting. And what's very interesting, that black layer, uh, th it's got covered by a windblown sand very quickly. What happens on this site is that the windblown sand starts to reform again and uh, reaccumulate after stabilising. And from now on, from about 750 onwards, it just continuously builds up and up and up, sometimes very quickly. Uh, those of you who worked on the site of volunteers know that sometimes you know, you'd be working at, uh, sometimes excavating a skeleton, you cover it over to go for lunchtime with a coat or something, and you come back and it's half covered by sand that's wind blown in in 20 minutes or so. And what seems to happen here is that black layer and that over enclosure and the rectangular structure disappears very quickly beneath sand. It may well be that that, that actual <coughs> what call it, feasting event, craft manufacture, whatever, was only lasted for two or three days, perhaps a matter of weeks at the most, before it got covered over. So it may just be like a, almost like a ceremonial opening of this structure. And when you look at that rectangular structure, it's very, very interesting. Uh, essentially what happened, the first bit they did was, was we took it all apart, it's all gone to the National Museum, all the, everything from it. But the first thing he did was dig a, dig a shallow hollow. And when we first came across this, we thought it was going to be a grave because we'd been just digging above it, grave after grave after grave, right down to this level. Uh, it's not, it's too, it's the wrong shape, uh, and it's not a grave. We thought perhaps an altar, but it's too low. We said, you know, an altar, you need to be a tabletop height thing. Uh, so presumably it's, a, it's some sort of shrine or memorial or cenotaph. But that central hollow, we analysed all the soil from it and there's absolutely nothing we could detect in it whatsoever. It's just pure sand. 
then essentially be able to put rectangular, sorry, upright shale slabs around it to form a rectangular shape, uh, fill it with soil and sand and stones, and then put covering slabs over it. And some things happen later, which I'll talk about in a second. And on those slabs, there's various bits of decoration scratched into them. Uh, so this is around about AD 750, and uniquely for, certainly in Wales, uh, and most of Britain and Ireland, uh, you've got a tiny inscription on this bit of stone. This is the one that faces due west again. So this is the first thing you would see as you came into the, this, this oval enclosure. Dunawek inscription, a little boat, what looks like a wave. That's it there. Uh, this, this was sent off, this name, to uh, Patrick Sims Williams, who works at the Centre of Advanced Celtic Studies at Aberystwyth University. And without actually knowing anything about the site, whatever, he said, it's an Irish name. It means, uh, the first part, dark brown or noble, and the second part means youth or warrior. Uh, so straight away, and he said it's, 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 it's uh, an antique name by the year 800. So without knowing anything about the site whatsoever, he came across that analysis. I spoke to him recently about this, uh, and he's having other thoughts about it. He's been in contact with other people who, who you know, specialise in Celtic language of the 8th century. <laughs> which probably there's not many around, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but there are, there are people. Uh, uh, and he's thinking now, actually, he, he thinks perhaps it now means uh, the infant Don rather than anything else, which is actually interesting. And you can take up all sorts of stories about what this means. What, you know, is, this, is this a memorial to Donoek, who was perhaps lost at sea? coming from Ireland, or is it, did Dunaway come visit the site as a pilgrim or whatever and scratch his name onto the, onto the slab and just indicate that's how he got here by a, this little boat. But when you look at the, the other slabs on this, other interesting things <coughs> are evident, a very nice interlaced cross design on this top slab very faintly scratched, very faint, but very fine. Uh, and these seem to be, uh, and other bits I'll show you in a second, acts of sort of personal devotion. They're not public art by any means. I mean, they're almost invisible to, 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 to see. I mean, certainly when Luke was working on the site with us, and uh, we didn't see it at first, did we, Luke? We just saw it in a stone slab, and then suddenly the sun caught it in a certain direction, the sun came out, you could just about see it. It's very, very faint. And you can see that from this photograph. That's a slab taken in low light by a museum. Uh, can you see it there? That's how faint it is. So what's it's picking out is actually the, the, the undulating surface, that <coughs> slate slab, rather than the actual extremely faint cross. Another small cross, again, just slightly scratched up on there, on that slab. And then this one here, very nice little design. What looks like a, some sort of gaming board, possibly an inscription there, though we can't make out what it is. And then a figure of a, a person, possibly a priest, with hands raised in that uh, Oran's praying position. Uh, and then down here, a little roundel, cross roundel. By a different hand, this is a lot deeper scratched, and so you suspect these are, these are by two different people, which you suspect actually are done by people visiting the site and even their own bit of devotion. And the only, only uh, stone which had, had what you might call professionally decorated was this one here. A very Heavily carved cross, almost certainly a reused grave marker. But interestingly, 
it was built as a side slab, which was cross was faced inwards, so it wouldn't have been visible. And so what happened, and this, this, this got covered by sand, and so it began to disappear from the landscape, fairly quickly, uh, one imagines. But as it did so, uh, quartz pebbles were placed on top of it. And again, one likes to think these are actually uh, placed there individually by people visiting the site uh, and leaving a pebble, uh, as some cultures still do uh, across the world, as, as a whatever mark it's, it's uh, leaving. Uh, and then on top of those was placed this stone, which has got this gaming board on it, which is one of these, uh, well, a, a pre-chess game, essentially. Uh, and there's been a lot written about why people do this. Uh, and one of the reasons being is that, that it's, it's quite common in sort of later medieval sites, particularly on, uh, you place these stones, these gaming board stones or bits of gaming board, uh, uh, on entrances to whatever, to houses or churches or whatever. And the idea being is that the devil would get distracted from playing the game and wouldn't enter the house. <laughs> but clearly, quite clearly, deliberately placed there. And as it, as it disappeared under sand, uh, it was never forgotten about. And this stone here uh, marks the marks it, it was a big upright stone, quite clearly placed there when this had, had virtually gone, it was virtually submerged in sand. And it's probably quite a big stone originally, but it, sn it snapped off at some point in the, perhaps the ninth century, but clearly marked that position of that rectangular structure for several decades, if not longer, once it disappeared. There's no burials at all at this stage, but then what happens, it becomes a cemetery. And that's the rectangular structure outlined there. That's the overall enclosure. And a very big cemetery wall is constructed. Rectangular cemetery entrance facing west, just as the over enclosure did. And the site becomes a cemetery, uh, but just for children, and extremely young children. There's about 30 or so in this first phase of use. Uh, and uh, why, why they're doing this, we're not, we don't know, essentially. But you can see there what is seen to be a desire on the part of the senior parents is to bear children as close as possible to that rectangular structure to the extent that they actually cut away part of those side top slabs and placed three burials in there of children and more around them. In this case, they've removed some of the uh, quartz pebbles and placed that uh, child burial directly on top. <coughs> uh, mostly they're, they're prenatal or perinatal burials. Uh, it may be its name of Donnerick had a special resonance with, for children, but certainly they are bringing people, the children here, especially to buried. How long have I got? Do you this about? A few minutes. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and after that initial period of burial of just children, uh, more sand comes in. Basically, from now on, what you get is sand, more burials, more sand more burials, and both adults and children being buried on the site. Uh, and eventually that rectangular cemetery wall, it's about a metre high, it's a big hefty wall, completely disappears from the sand. Uh, and with it, and just outside it, which is not a big area, we had about, I think it's 270 burials uh, in an area about not much bigger from that door to where I am, and about five metres wide, six metres wide. They're just stacked up in the, in the sand. Which I won't go into because that's another talk in its own. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, this is one of the better ones. This is a kiss grave. I mentioned a kiss grave right at the beginning. This is one of the best <coughs> ones we've had. Uh, and this was in 2014, 
uh, first year excavation. And what we've got here, this, this grave, as you see there, very nice upright marker stone, cross-shaped stone, has actually got a cross scratched into it. Uh, it's around about the year 900. So looking at perhaps you know, over 100 years later than that, that uh, earlier part of the site I mentioned. But this actually uh, sits over that big rectangular wall. So actually that wall has completely disappeared when you stand by this stage. And now this grave is, a, this, this level here, this stand level here, is about one and a half metres over that rectangular structure. And between it and this are 270 graves. This is one of the best, best, uh, best kiss graves. Uh, that's what you look like when you first find them. Uh, these are the ones which the uh, 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 2014 again, and the heads were the ones which were removed by erosion in 2014 by the big storms. Uh, so we'll be able to re re excavate those and reunite them. <coughs> just, just a, uh, what happened eventually on the site, over, over the top of everything, a big layer of, of rubble was laid down over the sand, over all these burials, and, which is this, this colour stuff. And then the chapel, St Patrick's <coughs> Chapel, was constructed, the stone-built chapel, which uh, was presumably ruined by... Uh, it's 1600. Uh, it's a very, very small chapel, uh, but still had burial right with it. But again, back just to children again now. So we've come full cycle, but not many. And it seemed to, burial right seemed to, to stop around about the 11th, 12th century. That's just the chapel, just to show what we, 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 how we did it. We, we have to. That's it as, as discovered, uh, and we removed it, uh, the west end of it completely, because that over enclosure and everything else is below there, below it. And the only way to deal with it is actually to remove it and excavate it completely. And if we didn't do it, the sea would do it. Uh, and that's just some of the later burials. But really interesting, <coughs> the, whole, the whole site's got interesting aspects to it. This is one of the latest ones, this very fine little child kiss grave uh, with quartz pebbles over it once again, but clearly meant to be seen. The idea is you would see this as a, on the surface if you visit the, the chapel. And even some of the tiny little graves still had the little crosses scratched upon them. And one of the few, art, apart from that, that earlier deposit I mentioned uh, with all the artefacts in it the only real other artefact was this pin which is made in Dublin around about the year 1050 or so pushed into the ground vertically just in front of the entrance to the chapel I won't say anything about uh, the human remains that's, again, that's a completely different uh, piece of work, piece of, uh, another talk, perhaps to say it is still <laughs> ongoing and we are having DNA analysis done of the, them and also isotopic analysis which will determine to some extent uh, the origin of the people, whether, whether where they grew up is different from where they died, which will be an interesting piece of evidence to get. And just to, the, the, the original question, is it, is it Irish or Welsh or That little boat's in the National Museum in Ireland. I mean, it's so similar to one scratched upon the, that stone. And when you look at, go to Ireland, if you go to the west coast of Ireland, you get these uh, yekta, as they're called, uh, which are quite well, very well known in the west coast of Ireland, particularly in a place called Onishimui, which has many of them. But you can see just how similar they appear to the one at St. Patrick's Chapel, which is unique in Wales. Uh, but this is the closest parallels <coughs> we have uh, anywhere to them. Uh, unfortunately, ones in Ireland, if I say unfortunately, uh, the ones in Ireland were, were, are still in use, and the suspicion is they've actually been modified uh, over time, particularly in the 17th and 18th century, when very much there's a revival of them. So what you see in Ireland may not have been what was originally intended. 
whereas the one at St. Patrick's Chapel is quite clearly, that's as it was. That's how it looked like in the 8th century. So that's it. I've sort of half answered that question, but not fully. <laughs>